There are some things in life that you just don't see coming. The world is random, unpredictable. Unlikely things can happen. So are you blessed with good fortune? Or are you one of the unlucky ones? But maybe there is a way through this mess of chance. Maybe the secret to being lucky is in trusting the maths. Fry. Welcome to the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures and let's start as we mean to go on. So who wants to be our first volunteer um, for the evening? Let's go you there if you want to come down in the pink jumper. Round of applause if you can as you come to the stage. Thank you. What's your name? Megan. Megan. Okay, Megan. Uh, how are you feeling today? You feeling lucky? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. If you just want to come here, um, just stand just stand, just there. Now, Megan, above your head. Uh, <laughs> We've got a bag of guns, um, and there's just a little rope uh, just there. What do you reckon we're going to do, Megan? For some reason, I feel like it's going to fall on me. <laughs> well, we thought about it. We thought about it quite hard, but actually, it's not going to fall on you. You're going to be the one who's going up there to help us uh, cut the rope. So if you want to nip up there um, with Fran just there. Uh, now, instead, uh, I am going to stand... Maybe not quite underneath it, but uh, what we've got here, the, the, the bag of guns is attached to a rope and just at the other end of the rope there, there's a, a, a tiny little weight that, that's uh, balancing it there. Uh, and once Megan cuts the rope, the gun is going to fall down this way and then either I've done my sums correctly, in which case the gun is going to stop once it hits about here, or it's going to drop all the way to the floor, go splat, and then everyone in the first row is, uh, is going to be covered in guns. OK, uh, definitely one of those two things. Now, if we manage to get through this unscathed, I want you all to burst into spontaneous applause. Um, and if, if this doesn't work, I'm just going to do the rest of the lectures covered in guns. OK, all right. Sound good. OK, Megan, how are you doing? You up there? Yeah. OK, you ready to uh, cut the rope? Are you ready? Do you want to give us a countdown? Five, four, three, three two, two, one. Whoa! <laughs> Ha-ha! <laughs> Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, you haven't ruined the lectures, so uh, well done for that. That was great. Okay, so what happened there? We had, we had a bag of uh, real guns there, which genuinely almost did, in fact, um, splat all over us. Oh, no! <laughs> it's fine. Uh, there's something quite special happened there, something quite extraordinary there happened um, to stop that gun from splatting everywhere. If you want to watch this back on a little slow-mo. So, the weight was just enough to make the rope swing around that bar and wrap around enough times to uh, cause the friction to stop the gun um, from dropping. We've got another angle of this. So here's the second angle. Now you think it's going to drop all the way down, just the last minute. There's just enough there for it to wrap around itself. Unwrapped itself there for a second, but we were safe. We were okay. We didn't get splattered. Now here's a, uh, a slightly smaller version here to explain what, what happened. Now we calculated that if this weight here is 14 times lighter than the item on the other end, then that is enough to make sure that it would always stop itself from falling. Now, I knew that for sure, of course. You all knew, surely, that I knew that for sure. But still, it's, you know, it's inevitable that you, that you feel a little bit worried. Um, and that, I think, is something that you have to accept. You know, we're all humans. We, are, uh, we find it hard to override our instincts. We're not, we're not built for calm and rational thought. 
But that is the reason why we created mathematics. It's a way to step outside of ourselves and be objective, a way to calmly calculate something and be sure of the answer rather than just rely on what our, our messy minds might tell us. And you know what? I'm a very big believer that maths can offer you a new way at looking at almost anything. Because I think if you take the time to look, thank you very much, um, there are mathematical patterns hiding behind almost everything even things that feel like they are very far away uh, from being mathematical, even things that you think should be completely random. And we're going to come back to this one um, in a moment. But in the meantime, uh, my fellow mathematician, Matt Parker, has got a perfect example for us, haven't you, Matt? Hello, yes, I've got a huge group of people out here in the entranceway to the RI, if you'd like to come out and join me. Sure thing. So thank you very much, everyone who came along bizarrely, all wearing red hats. That's fantastic. And all of you wearing yellow. Well, how fortunate. This must be the new fashion. So we're going to try and experiment with all of you in a moment to see what happens when you're moving through a crowd. OK, when you're moving in a crowd, I mean, everyone's making their own decisions. It's random, surely. It feels very random, yeah. very chaotic, unorganized. You're being bounced around. However, there are some patterns and Actually, we, we want them to walk naturally, so yeah. we're not going to tell them when the experiment starts. Okay. So, watch this. Um, actually, I'm really sorry, everyone. We've just realized, don't move yet, that we wanted the yellow hats on this side. We wanted, I know, the red hats on this. not me. It's coming from upstairs. So I think we're clear. OK, if you can, quick as you can, if you just swap over sides exactly where you are, but opposite across. OK, so you can see here, we've got an overhead camera rigged up, so we can see. Come on, everyone, as quick as you can. Hurry up. Come on, faster, please. We've got a TV show to do. Here we go. So, so they're this, not all jumbled it's up. It's not random, is no. it? Right? Look at this. So having because some everyone's wild issues here. Everyone's just following each other, yeah. and you end up with these very clear lines. So if these were random, it'd be a complete mix. Instead, we've got these fantastic stripes. Well, come on, everyone. Let's keep it moving. <laughs> you end up uh, with these fantastic stripes. Look at that. So uh, everyone, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And that was the experiment, so <laughs> thanks very much for getting involved. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Um, now, it turns out there are actually a lot of similarities between uh, the maths of how people... <laughs> Be quiet down there. How people flow through a corridor and, uh, and how fluids behave. And if you can understand how people move when they're in a crowd, you can predict how they'll react in the case of an emergency. And that's something that's incredibly important if you are designing buildings or stadiums or train stations to make sure that your design is as safe as it can possibly be. And that really, that is the point. That is what math is all about. It's all about discovering those invisible patterns, like this beautiful pattern left here by that swinging pendulum. Isn't that gorgeous? Much neater, I think. Uh, than, you would, than you would expect. But you know, math isn't just about spotting patterns, it's also about using them to your advantage. So here is something that, uh, that might look as though it's random. Uh, best part of Christmas, obviously. Who gets the toy? Who gets to wear uh, the hat? Um, now, here you go, if you want to go on this. Could you only do this, go for it, a few times a year, you may not notice there we go, you can have that one. You may not notice that there is actually a pattern to this, but luckily I've done hundreds of these and there is a knack to winning that I can, uh, I can explain to you. So what you do, we have to, I'll teach you right, and then I can show you. So what you want to do, you want to hold your end lower than the other person, um, use two hands with a really sort of uh, steady, firm hold, and you don't want to do any twisting or, or um, pulling, you don't, want to, you don't want to really tear this. So what you're trying to do, ultimately, you're trying to let the other person do all of the work so that then, you end up winning. Well done. You can have the hat now. Enjoy. <laughs> now, I've got to be straight with you. This isn't going to work every single time, especially not if your uh, opponent knows the same trick as you and you're just steadily trying to get lower and lower than the other person. But the maths of prediction isn't about saying what's definitely going to happen. It's about considering all of the possible outcomes and working out what's likely to happen. So to show you what I'm talking about here, Join me in welcoming University Challenge mathematician and school teacher Bobby Seagull. <laughs> hey, Bobby. Hi. How are you? It's very good to see you. Okay, Bobby. What have you been doing there, Bobby? So I've been flipping coins hundreds of times. Okay. On a un, sort of fair, unbiased coin, you'd expect the chance of a head or tail to be 50 50. Yeah. So I thought, let me try and test this by flipping a coin six times in a row. So you'd expect six times in a row, you'd expect three heads, three tails, right? Yes, but sometimes 
things don't quite work out the way we want them to. So have you been flipping a coin six times in a row, many times in yes, a row? Yes, Mr. Seagull's a true maths hero <laughs> teacher, flipping it 2,000 times. No, 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 no. I had to enlist the help of school students. Nice. So we went across London, found students from Westminster Academy, thank you, and students from my very own school, Little Ilford. And that's these guys here, right? Yes, exactly, these students here. So we got them to line up, all with a coin in their hand, and flipping the coin six times. Okay. If they get ahead, they take one step in that direction. And can you guess what happens when they flip a tail? I'm going to go this direction. You're right. And let's see what happens when they flip the coins. So this is like a visual representation of the six flips. Okay, so that's the third flip there, is it? Yep. And that's the fourth. You can see wind blowing the ties uh -huh. about. Fifth okay, so they're spreading out. Every, every extra flip, they're spreading out more and more. Exactly. And now, if we get the students to move down towards the graph, Oh, it's like a you human start bar to chart. see a pattern emerging. <laughs> oh, there's a very good, so there's way more people in the middle there. Yes, and roughly the same number on the tails and the head side, and a few who've got six tails and six heads. So these are these are three heads, three tails on this side. Exactly. All they, I mean, these guys must have thought they were yeah. very lucky. And down here, all uh, all tails. Exactly. Okay. But you didn't just do this once either, did you? I mean, this is like nested, uh, lots of levels to this. Exactly. So many classes, repeating it many times to get us a better data set. Okay. So here we see, this is Westminster Academy students. So, I mean, pretty much every single time we're seeing most people being in the middle, but you always get these bits at the end. You always get the extremities. But the beauty comes when we try and combine all the information. So here we see... All these little dots, they're a student, a proud, hard-working math student. <laughs> and you put them together and we get what looks like a normal distribution ah, curve. Ah, and this is what the maths would have predicted. Exactly. The beginning. Very lovely. Thank you very much, Bobby Seagull. Thank you. <laughs> the point that we're trying to make here is that life is full of randomness, but even in the midst of chance, maths can still tell you what might happen and also tell you just how likely that might be, which, of course, is precisely what <coughs> predictions are all about. So, OK, let's take a prediction about the future that we are all very familiar with, uh, what the weather is going to be like tomorrow. So I got this, um, got this from my phone earlier. This is my weather app. Um, and this here, it says that tomorrow the chance of rain is 20%. Question is, what does that 20% actually mean? When it comes to talking about the chance of rain, what does that 20% mean? actually mean? Who wants to kick us off? You want to make a guess as to what you think 20% means in that context? The chances are probably 20% it's going to cover. Okay, yeah, 20% is going to cover. So you think it's about 20% of the space will get covered um, in rain. What do you reckon? 20% of what? Do you want to give me a guess? Anyone here want to give me a guess? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, how much of the country is going to have rain in it? Okay, good, good response. Okay, okay. Well, let's let's ask someone who really knows. I want to introduce you to someone who, um, as you will find out, their life depends on correctly predicting the future. Um, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Professor Chris Jackson. <laughs> hey, Chris. Hey, how are you doing? Yes, thank you. Okay, Chris. So how did they do in terms of understanding that 20%? How did that audience do? They did pretty well. Yeah, they did very well. What does it actually mean? It means that if I was to live the same day over and over 100 times, it would rain on 20 of those days. Does it tell you whether you should bring an umbrella or not, though? I'm a pessimist. You should always bring an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just saying. No one likes getting wet, no. right? No one likes getting wet. Um, but you don't predict the weather, do you, Chris? No, I don't. Something much more risky. Yeah, I try and understand when vol how volcanoes behave and when they might erupt. And you use those predictions to actually go in volcanoes. Yes, right? I do. Some, um, yeah. uh, little photo here. I mean, that's pretty close, right? Yeah, it's pretty close, but it's important what we're doing as scientists. Uh, but it's, you know, we handle the risk. And so you're calculating this risk at all times, are you? Yeah, we're, we have visual observations on the volcano, how active it is, but also we have an idea of what the likelihood of that this volcano may erupt while we're there. Have you ever had a close call? I've never had a close call, not yet at least. OK, no. all right. Well, um, of course, because this is the Christmas lectures, we've got a model of a volcano uh, to yes. demonstrate. Yeah. So you can tell us a bit about how your predictions work using this thing here. OK, yeah. So um, the thing with volcanoes is it's, they're very difficult to see inside and underneath. So we have to rely on a number of observations observations while we're looking at the volcano. So one thing we can use is um, 
analysis of the gas that comes out of the volcano. So by looking at the amount of gas and the type of gas, because gas is contained in magma, if we measure that, we can have an idea if magma is moving into the volcano and the volcano might be about to erupt. And so if you see this kind of gas, you're calculating the risk of an eruption. At yes, exactly. How much gas and what type of gas may actually kind of give us an indication of what the um, nearness of an eruption is. Yeah. And are there other things that you're looking out for? Yeah, so another thing we can look for is magma moves into the volcano, it pushes against the rock, the rock fractures and releases energy in the form of earthquakes. So if we can measure the earthquakes where they are in the volcano, and we can actually measure the vo uh, earthquakes in terms of how strong they are as well. Um, with the gases together, we may be able to use that in some sort of like forecasting sense. So what's the likelihood? Are there some signs that are sort of absolute no-nos where you won't enter a, vol a volcano after that point? Yeah, I think if, you know, there's lots of gas, lots of earthquakes, maybe even lava coming out the top of it, that's probably time to leave. Time to, <laughs> <laughs> time to take a bit of a probably step back. Step back yes. <laughs> maybe let's do that. Let's then. do that. So this one looks like it's imminent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness we've got the glasses on then, huh? <laughs> Have you ever been at an actual volcanic eruption? I have, yes. Because this stuff is really serious, right? This is not just playful. It's absolutely serious. It's serious for the people who work in and around volcanoes, but it's even more serious for the people who have to live with them every single day. Yeah. So this one looks like it's imminent. This one looks like it's imminent. I'm going to say, you know, probably 90% chance at the moment it's going to erupt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Oh. <laughs> That's 100% chance. Yeah, right. <laughs> to say about a 90% prediction, 10% of the time that volcano won't explode. And while it sounds like I'm saying something quite obvious there, when you are dealing with the messy world of uncertainty, you need to understand that being wrong is sometimes part of prediction because sometimes errors can have unexpected consequences. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about here because uh, we have just had a delivery of 100 Christmas presents. And the rumours are that hiding amongst these 100 presents, there are five brand new smartphones. And one of you gets to come down and open one of these presents at random. Uh, so, who wants to come down and... <laughs> What a surprise. Uh, perfect. All right, so let's see who we can find. Uh, if you want to come down there, yeah, perfect. Round of applause. <laughs> What's your name? Yiling. Yiling, perfect. Okay, Yiling. All right, so uh, if you want to stand over just over there. Now, you're going to get to pick one of these presents completely at random. Five of them are phones. Uh, the other 95, they're kind of rubbish presents, like socks and satsumas. No one wants any of them. And because you only get to pick one present, we want to give you the best possible chance at, uh, at getting a phone. But luckily, Matt Parker has invented a very special present scanning machine to help you. How many, Matt? Look at All this. Right. Yeah. This amazing. This is my Xmas Ray Detector 0 0.80. And what we can do is we can put these presents through the scanner. Actually, do you want to come with me around over here? If you want to stand behind like the conveyor belt over here where they come out, if I turn this machine on and I start putting the presents in the top here, it will try and detect if there's a phone in them. If there's no phone, it just spits them out the same way they went in. If it thinks there's a phone, it rewraps it. Look at that. Ah, oh, that's a winner. So if it says phone, you put it on the table. If it doesn't say phone, we don't care, right? Just down there somewhere. Is that OK? Are you ready? I'm going to start piling them in here. You, uh, you And you seem... sort them out. Here they come. You seem pretty happy with this machine. I'm very man. proud. Yeah. It is, uh... how, how accurate is it? This machine is 80% accurate. OK, 80% accurate. That's, that's pretty good, man. 80% accurate. OK, so then one of these, then, that's rewrapped as a phone. What do you reckon are the chances that this is a phone? Shout out what you think it is. OK, okay all right, let's... Let's, uh, let's think this through then. So, um, your machine, how accurate is your machine? 80% accurate. Okay. So, your machine is 80% accurate. There are five phones in total. 80% accurate means that it's only going to find four of them, right? Which does, yeah. Matt, that does mean one phone's going to end up on the floor. Yes, the downside to 80% accurate is it's 20% inaccurate. Ah. But on the upside, 80% accurate. Okay, so, I mean... You make a good point. Thank you. So, OK, one phone on the floor. It's not the end of the world. Still gives you a really good chance uh, at finding a phone. 
There's something going on there, though. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Stop the, stop the machine. Stop the machine. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, hang on. Matt? Yeah? There are way more than four phones on that table. <laughs> yeah. It's 80% accurate at both detecting a phone and detecting not a phone. Are you saying, hang on, are you saying this machine is taking socks and satsumas and wrapping them as phones when they're not? Yeah, 20% of them. <laughs> I don't know if I brought this up earlier, Hannah, but it's 80% accurate. <laughs> yeah, but Matt, there's 95 socks and satsumas here. Yeah. 20%, that's, not, that's 19 rubbish presents in that pile of phones. Yeah, but 80% of them are down here. <laughs> uh, so the problem is, like, the act, like, this is 80% accurate. It doesn't mean these are going to be 80% phones. Yeah. It just means, and I'd like to recap, that my machine is 80% accurate. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. But right, by the time you're finished, you're going to have, what, 23 presents over here. Only four of them are going to be phones. Yep. That gives you a four in 23 chance it's of finding a phone. 17%. So it wasn't... A OK, well, do you want to pick one at random? I mean, you can open it, have whatever the size. It's overwhelmingly likely to be a Satsuma. Well, you can keep it, though. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Thanks for your machine, Matt. My pleasure. Amazing. 80% accurate. <laughs> that kind of error... That kind of error, mislabeling Satsumas as phones, it's something that's called a false positive. And it goes to show how maths can sometimes really prove your intuition is wrong. Now, false positives, they're everywhere. You see this every time you go through an airport. Think about all of the people that are pulled over from the scanner for having lip balm and hair straighteners uh, in their luggage. And the number of people who are false positives massively overwhelms the number of real weapons that uh, the security team are looking for. But there is a, a really dark side to this kind of error too, because imagine if instead of scanning for presence, we were screening for cancer. Now, even if a cancer screening test, like a blood test or a mammogram, the, the ones that work with 89% accuracy, because they are not perfect, there will always be false positives. There will always be people who believe that they have cancer when in reality they actually have nothing to worry about. This is kind of present scanning, but from the perspective of, of the gift box. And you can imagine just how much pain and anxiety uh, it might cause to, to be mislabeled. Now, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't be screened, but it's really important to understand what these results mean. But okay. If you can accept that being right isn't always possible, if you can really understand these numbers, then you can still use them to your advantage. Because sometimes luck really is a matter of life and death, or in this case, zombies. So uh, to explain this properly, I would like you to join me in giving a warm welcome to an epidemiologist from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Ros Ego. OK, Roz, you, you study the mathematics of disease, right? How exactly. much of it is luck and chance? Well, there's a lot of chance that's involved in the transmission of disease. So if there's an epidemic happening at the moment, the chance of you getting it depends on how many other people there are that have the uh, infection at the time. And then if you happen to meet one of those, which is more likely when there's a lot of people um, who have it, there's also a chance you'll get it from them or not. And if you have some pre-existing immunity, maybe you've been vaccinated or you've had it before, then the chance of them passing it to you also goes down. So there's a lot. So then how can maths help you? Mm. It's really difficult to predict on an individual level if somebody will get it. But on a population level with these nice big numbers, there's some things we can predict. When the epidemic will go up and when it will come down, we try and predict the peak and we try and predict which groups might be at risk of infection. Well, talking of epidemics, mm. there are some rumours of a zombie apocalypse about to hit. Um, OK, so everyone here, underneath your seats, you should have a, uh, a zombie mask and you should have some ping pong balls. Now, these, these are your zombie germs. Mm -hmm. So how it works is if a zombie germ touches you, you become a zombie, you put up your zombie mask, and then you take your zombie germs and you throw them straight up in the air as high as you possibly can. Okay. And in a moment, I'm going to start off this infection. So everyone start with your mask down um, to kick us off. Mm. But you can make a prediction about what might happen here. Mm. So over here, nobody has any protection against zombie, zombie infection. So we're going to expect a lot of cases and possibly quite quickly. Okay, all right, let's give it a go. Is everyone ready? Everyone got their balls in their hand? All right, we're going to start this infection. Here's the zombie germs coming at you. I mean, I... <laughs> 
I'm directly targeting people. Okay, ooh, already. <laughs> So we've got little, actually a few different patches here. We do, yeah. But it's starting to get a little bit frightening around here. And it's traveling backwards mm -hmm. through the, and now forwards. <laughs> a big cluster of zombies there right in the middle. Uh-huh. <laughs> how realistic is what they're doing compared to how, norm, to, to how real diseases spread? Um, well, obviously, for real diseases, it's not quite so frightening as ha what's happening up here. <laughs> but we use similar type of methods using chance to pass on infection to understand how real diseases spread around. But for zombie infections, nobody ever recovers. Nobody, okay. And that, in the real world, people usually recover. I think there are, in fact, okay, so if you, <laughs> it's still going. It is still okay. going. Um, if you are uh, not a zombie, could you stand up for us? How many people are there? Oh, we've got Just some. A, Yes, uh, three people who managed to escape the zombie vessels. <laughs> <laughs> you also can't target people directly with your zombie germs. That wasn't part of the no, rules. It okay, um, everybody sit down. Thank you very much. Well done. Um, now, we can do this again, mm -hmm. but this time we can use some kind of zombie defences. Exactly, yeah. So over here, there's going to be some protection against infection, and these people are going to be completely protected. Okay, so those of you who have, you've got protective masks under your seat. And this makes you completely immune from zombie infections. It does, yep. Okay, so if the, the zombie germs touch you and you're wearing a face mask, uh, you're wearing a protective mask, don't worry about anything. Don't put up your, don't put up your zombie mask, don't throw any germs around. Um, you're, you're, you're completely immune and we'll see, how, we'll see what happens now. And what's your prediction about what will happen in this case? Well, there's a lot of protection up here, so I think the epidemic will be over very quickly and maybe not many people will be infected. Okay, let's give it a go. Here we go. <laughs> okay. So it's still started. We've got a few. Oh. Oh. Okay. I mean, that basically, that stopped almost immediately. Okay, so those of you who are not wearing a protective mask, but are also not a zombie, could you stand up? Oh, goodness me, look at that. Wow, it's a lot. And there's a point to it. Thank you very much, Owen. You can sit down. There's a point to all of this, mm. right? Yeah, exactly. So the protection that we had in the population from the people wearing masks who are vaccinated against infection has protected everybody in this part of the audience from getting infection. And is this the same thing that happens when we're vaccinated against diseases? Exactly, it is. So we have here um, kind of this community has immunity from infection. And so even the people who weren't themselves vaccinated have been protected by the protection in the whole community. So how much does the maths of, of modelling disease make a difference back in the real world? Mm. So we, we take experiments kind of like this, but in the computer, and take things that we know about how infection spreads and about the population in general, and the goal is to use the computers, use our simulations, to figure out ahead of time what would be the best interventions. What should we do to decrease the number of cases in everybody without it having to happen? So it doesn't matter whether you're talking about flus or Ebola or I know, TB in cows. You exactly. can use these mathematical ideas. Yeah, for human diseases, for animal diseases, even for plants, it's really useful. And demonstrates that vaccines really do make a difference. It does. I d it does. Would you rather live over here with all these zombies or over here? Definitely over Definitely there. over here. Roz, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. There is a really simple point in all of this. If you've got maths on your side, it's not just about spotting patterns. It's about using what the numbers tell you to bend the world to your will. And there is one game of luck, skill and stats that actually captivates millions of us every single week. Because believe it or not, the Premier League is awash with mathematicians. So here is, uh, here's the staff photo from uh, Liverpool Football Club. You've got the team manager there, obviously a very important job. Um, but here, this is a group of mathematicians. These guys are the unsung heroes of Liverpool football team. Uh, and it's their job to make the team as lucky as possible. So please join me in welcoming Tim Waskett. And that's you in that photo, Tim. Yeah, that's me just there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so how on earth do you go about changing a football game into, into something to do with numbers? So the primary currency that every football game uh, is uh, based on is goals, obviously. That's the most important thing. Uh, and it's our job to turn every action on the pitch, every pass, every throw-in, every tackle, every shot, 
into a gold probability. And I think we've actually got uh, uh, an image from your team. So this is yep. this is showing you that the, the darker the colour, the darker the red, the more likely you are to score. I mean, from there, it's pretty easy, yes, right? Yes, exactly. Score so, pretty easy from there. so this is taken from literally hundreds of thousands of shots through major leagues all over the world. And by looking at where the shots take place, how often they became a goal gives us a probability of a shot from a similar situation ultimately ending it as a goal. Now I understand that there's a little game that you, uh, that you play with all of this of trying to guess what the math says is the probability of a, of a yep. particular uh, shot going in. Yes. So I think we have a little clip. Um, so we call this the expected goals game. Okay. So what game are we watching here? So this is a friendly between <laughs> Tranmere Rovers and uh, Liverpool. This is a pre-season friendly. And uh, you pause the footage just... Yep. So we've got the, he's about to do a so header. So he's about to do a header and he's right in front of the goal there, uh, very close. Uh, so what do we think the probability of this shot turning into a goal is? What does the maths calculate the chances of this turning into a goal? So we have do some you options. Do you reckon it's 50%, 75%, or 99%. Okay, shout out your answers. What do you think it is? What do you reckon the, the, the math says of the chances? Ooh, 75 came out quite clearly there. Yeah. All right, what's the actual, what does the, what does the math say? Well, the actual answer here is 99%. Ooh. So that means in exactly the same position with exactly the same surroundings, if you reran this 100 times, it would only not result in a goal once. Exactly, so 99 shots of a similar sort of position will end in a goal and only one will get saved by the goalkeeper. Oh, okay, all right, let's try one more. Let's try one more, we've got, more. We've got another clip for you. There we go. Oh, okay, so he's much further out here. Yeah, much further out, and he's also not central onto the goal. He's uh, off to one side. So we know it's going to be a lower chance. It's going to definitely be a lower chance. But, but what uh, does the maths actually calculate it to be? So we've got some options for you. All right, do you reckon the math says that this is 4%, 7% or 10% chance of getting a goal? What do you reckon? Shout out for me. <laughs> oh, everyone's going in the middle there. Everyone's What's going the in answer? the middle there, and you're spot on. It's actually 7%. And let's see what actually did happen. Ah, oh, so missed. One of the reasons that that was only uh, 7% and not any higher was because he shot it straight at the goalkeeper. Ah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's always a big mistake, don't you? Exactly. <laughs> um, but it's not just about strikers that, you, that you're translating into numbers, is it? No, exactly. So this is the easiest thing that we can do, but we can do a similar calculation for every other event on the pitch. So any time a ball is passed, for Ooh. example. OK, so to help us to demonstrate this, uh, I'd like to invite onto the stage Bertie and Jamie uh, from a London youth team. Okay. Bertie and Jamie are just going to have a bit of a kick about. Yep. Uh, tell us how this works then. So for roughly 200 games uh, per weekend, uh, we get data um, involving every single ball touch in the game. So uh, the way the data is collected, every time that a player passes the ball, they'll mark it on the pitch and they'll say this is the position on the pitch and the player who made that pass and then there'll be somebody watching for the other team making their passes. So two people will be going backwards and forwards, marking up all of these events. So roughly every second or so, there's a new pass. So it's pretty frantic. So you just have someone there clicking, clicking, clicking. I mean, it doesn't sound like the most exciting way to watch football. No, well, thankfully it's not us who has to do this, uh, this work. We actually have a data supplier who provides us with these, these data, uh, these files for okay. us. Okay, Bertie and Jamie, thank you very much for your help there. Thank you. So what do you end up with once you've, once you've done all of this? So for every game, we get approximately 2,000 ball touch events, um, and that tells us the position of the player who makes the pass. But what that doesn't tell you is where all of the other players are on the pitch at that moment. But you can get hold of that, those numbers? So we can. Uh, for the Premier League games, we get what we call tracking data. And so this is a set of um, cameras all around the stadium, and that's monitoring the position of um, all of the players. Um, so 22 players plus the position of the ball. Uh, and it does that for 25 frames a second uh, for the full 90 minutes. So you end up with approximately 1.5 million data points. That is a lot of numbers. And in fact, we've got here under the gigantic spreadsheet, essentially. So th this is just one game. And we're, this, you're watching a game of football here, basically. This is, through, yes, exactly. <laughs> through yep. numbers. OK, so an interesting, I mean, maybe less exciting than watching Match of the Day. Well, in, but, uh, it depends uh, <laughs> on your perspective, yes. But, but you're not just collecting these numbers, are you? What, what do you do with them? So this, uh, this data can give us a goal value for every, every position and for every player on the pitch. And what does it end up looking like? We've got, I think we've got a little um, Yep, we have a little example. animation. OK, so tell us what we're looking at here. So uh, this is what we call pitch control. Uh, so you can see the players are in the circles there, and the arrows represent the direction and speed that they can travel in. 
And you've got a blue team and a red team. Yep, so the red team here is actually Liverpool. Um, and the areas in red um, are places that the Liverpool players can get to uh, sooner than the players who are in blue. Ah, based on how quickly people run yes. and based on where the ball is. Uh, exactly. So, uh, for example, the ball in this particular example is that yellow dot there. Uh, and if this player who is currently in possession of the ball, this is number 10, this is uh, Sadio Mane, uh, his best option at this stage is to probably pass to one of these red areas. And in fact, he ends up passing the ball up into this red zone here to be picked up by player 66, which is Trent Alexander-Arnold. So this is a real game, this and, real and we, game. Can, we can play it on watching the game uh, <laughs> through this heat map here. So uh, this thing here, what's this telling us? So this is what I was talking about before, about turning everything into a gold probability. So this value now, 1.3%, this is the, uh, the probability uh, that a goal will be scored with the ball in this position within the next 15 seconds. <laughs> it's quite hard from there, really. From there, yes, because you're so far back. <laughs> uh, you've got a long way to go before you yeah, reach the goal. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty accurate. But you can, you, we can play on this game and see, what, uh, see how it evolves. So the ball does get passed over. Yep. It gets successfully received. Uh, still not a very high chance of scoring a goal from there. No, but uh, now Trent Alexander-Arnold, his best option is to run into this position here. Ah. So he's now dribbling the ball forwards. So are you using this information to look at what did happen and work out what should have happened? So we use this in a number of ways. The main, re the main way we use this is to um, evaluate player performance after the game. And in this particular game, if we play on one more time, what was the result of this sequence? So if we pause it right about now, you can see Trent Alexander-Arnold now has the ball very close to the goal. He's in a good position, but his best option now is to pass into this red area here where it can either be received by uh, Mane or uh, Shakiri, who is number 23 down here. One of these two players is most likely to get to this uh, red zone. And in actual fact, what happens in this particular situation is that Mane receives the ball around about here and he scores a goal. Which is exactly what you want. Exactly. So are you using this stuff to, to just analyse your team or are you using it to analyse other teams too? So the advantage of this is we see all of the players at the, at the same time, which means that we can analyse uh, all of the players within the Premier League and a, uh, a large number of players uh, in the, all sorts of other leagues around the world using the ball touch event data. And that gives us um, some really good uh, information on which players are doing well and who we might be able to sign in the future ultimately to give you the best chance possible at beating your opponent. Exactly. Amazing. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. That's the thing about being lucky. Sometimes it's not just about what you do, but also about who you're up against. And if winning is what you're after, something rather intriguing happens when you start to look at the maths of competition. OK, so for this, I would like two volunteers who are willing to compete against one another. Um, OK, perfect. If you want to come down here, uh, that's one. And we'll get someone from over here. Um, yes, yeah, keep going. Round of applause, I'm say. What was your name? Nat. Perfect. OK, Nat. Thank you. And what was your name? Jasmine. Jasmine. OK, Nat and Jasmine. Right, OK. This game is called goody or baddie, right? And the reason why is because in every round, you have two choices. You can either decide to be a goody, in which case you put on your red hat, or you can decide to be a baddie, in which case you put on your purple hat. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna play four rounds, and in each round, you have a chance to win some points. If you get to 12 points in those four rounds, then you win an amazing goody bag, okay? I mean, it's pretty special. Um, so this is the way that it works, okay? If both of you decide to be a goody, then you will end up getting three points each. If both of you decide to be a baddie, you will end up getting one point each. But if one of you decides to be a goody and the other person decides to be a baddie, then the baddie takes everything. They get five points and the other person gets nothing, okay? Remember, four rounds, you have to get to 12 points. You happy? Yep. Okay, all right, turn around so you can't see each other's choices. Here we go, okay, here we go. So red for goody, purple for baddie, make your choices now. Oh. Turn around and have a look at each other. Oh, okay, all right, five points, five points there. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, all right, round two, round two. Here we go, here we go, here we go, okay. Okay, round two. He stole some points off you that time. Let's go for round two. Oh, 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 payback, turn around, turn around. Uh, only one point each, you blocked in there. Okay, right, round three, round three, here we go. <laughs> and choose, make your choice for round three. <laughs> and uh, turn around and have a look at each other. Ah, 
You got him back. You got him back. You got him back. Okay, there's still one round left. One round left. One round left. Turn around. Here we go. Okay, do you want to take your hat off um, and make your choices? Go for it. <laughs> what an unsurprising ending. Turn around and have a look at each other. Okay, so neither of you, I'm afraid, neither of you got up to, uh, got up to the line. Neither of you got to our points. Um, but you know what's strange, though? There were four rounds. 12 points was all you needed to win a prize. If both of you had just played goody every single time, then you both would have walked away with an amazing prize. The fact that you played badly, you've blocked each other. But you know what, it's understandable, it's understandable because, okay, let's say, let's say, do you mind if I take this hat off your head for a second? Let's say your opponent, let's say your, your opponent um, had chosen to be a baddie. In that situation, you've got two choices, right? You can be a goody, in which case you get no, no, no points at all, or you could be a baddie, in which case you get one point. So if your opponent's a baddie, being a baddie is definitely the best thing to do. But what if, you mind switching your hats for me, if your opponent instead had chosen to be a goodie, let's think about what, what, what was available to you. Be a goodie, you get three points. Baddie, you get five points. So even in this situation, it's best off for you to be a baddie. So it turns out, it doesn't matter what your opponent does, in any one round, it is always best for you to play the baddie even though if you'd both just played goody, you both would have ended up getting a prize. So uh, thank you very much to my volunteers here. <laughs> You're both very bad. <laughs> Not very Christmassy, is it, being bad to each other? And um, this, actually, this is a very famous game among uh, mathematicians, and it goes to show that winning isn't always about luck. But it also, I think, highlights one of the great tragedies of humanity, that sometimes the tempting thing to do right then and there doesn't actually lead to the very best outcome overall. And actually, you see this time and time again, the very tiny little selfish choices that we all make, they add up to mean that eventually uh, we can all lose out. So it doesn't matter here whether you're talking about climate change or plastic waste or North Sea fishing, we often get sidetracked by the really small choices in front of us rather than holding the big picture um, in our minds. And part of that is a mathematical reason, as we've just seen with that game, when, when the incentives aren't set up to, to encourage really good behaviour. But I think it's also worth remembering that as humans, we are not these perfectly rational objects. If you really want to be lucky, then you have to take all of the weirdnesses of humans into account. So, okay, let's have a look at some of your weirdnesses um, as an audience. Uh, underneath your seat, you should have a, uh, a whiteboard and, uh, and a pen. What we're gonna do, if you can get those out and get them ready, what we're gonna do is, uh, when I say go, I want you to pick a number completely at random between one and 10, and I want you to write it on your whiteboard. When I say go, um, and then we'll hold them up, okay? Number between one and 10, completely at random, go. And then hold it up when you're finished. And let's have a look at what you've got. Okay, okay, let's have a little look at what we've got. Okay, come on, I see here. Okay, okay. All right, I'll tell you what. Uh, if you wrote down a one, could you stand up? Oh, hardly, certainly not 10% of the audience, that is it. Okay, all right, thank you very much, sit down. Uh, if you wrote down a 10, could you stand up? Oh, again, only a smattering, how intriguing. All right, sit down. If you wrote down a seven, could you stand up? Oh, I see, all of a sudden. <laughs> Thank you very much, you can sit down. Um, now, in fact, actually, if you play this with big groups of people, it almost always happens that seven is the most common number um, to be chosen. You know, a, a huge swathe of people will choose a seven. And there's a kind of strange reason for that. If you're picking a random number, one feels like it's too small, 10 feels like it's too big, five is kind of too much in the middle, two's even, can't choose that one, eight's sort of too neat, all the other numbers fall away, and you're left if you're picking a number at random with only seven really feeling like um, the, the random number. I guess the point in all of this is that you have to remember that human behaviour really isn't actually random. Humans are not very good at logical machines. And what that means is that if you really want to make yourself lucky, you've got to go beyond the world of maths. Because you know, there is actually some evidence that shows that just thinking you are blessed with good fortune means you can actually make your own luck. And there is someone who knows quite a lot about this. Uh, this is Dr. Michael Gervais in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, he's known as the, uh, the secret weapon of top athletes around the world. Uh, hello, Michael, how are you doing? I'm fantastic. Great to be here. Thank you, Hannah. And you have worked with a number of amazing people, haven't you, Michael? 
I've been fortunate in that, yes, for sure. What is it that you do? Well, by trade and training, I am a sport and performance psychologist. So you're trying to get people in the right mindset to win? Yeah, the, the, there's three things that we can train as humans. We can train our craft, our body, and our mind. And world-leading thinkers and doers are not leaving one of those three up to chance. And the science is informing us of best practices to be able to train our mind, to be able to adjust to the unfolding, unpredictable unknown. So do you have any, do you have any top tips for us as to, as to how to train our minds to, to get the best out of ourselves? You know, I wish I had tips and <laughs> tricks and hacks and shortcuts, and there really aren't many. And so if we can learn from the best in the world how to fundamentally organize your life to strengthen your mind to deal with the unknown. And what we've come to find out is that there are a handful of skills that people practice, mindfulness being one of them, optimism being another, and those are trainable skills. Confidence is a trainable skill. Being able to be calm in any environment is a trainable skill. So those are a handful of a few that are most employed by most. I hear that you've worked with a few daredevil skydivers. I think we have a little clip of uh, one of the people you trained. So just tell us what Luke Aikens did. He's here in the green. Yeah, absolutely. So Luke Aikens is one of the most extraordinary base jumpers, um, aeronautical flight folks in the world. And what he did, he was the first ever to do this, is that he jumped from 30,000 feet, which is, in and of itself is a big deal because you need oxygen mass to be able to carry enough oxygen. But he did it without a parachute. Without a, a parachute. Yeah, and he was the first person to do that. And he jumped into a 16-story net that he and his team built. And so you were behind the scenes in advance of this event trying to get him to, to, to focus in the right way. Yeah, when, when your life is on the line and the stakes are high and consequences are real, nobody leaves very much up to chance. And so training your mind is one of the ways to help somebody have great command of themselves under duress. And so absolutely, yeah, this is one, this is an uh, uh, incredibly dangerous project. Do you think he's mad? <laughs> <laughs> I get that question a lot. No, he's, he is actually just like some of the greatest mathematicians in the world, just like some of the greatest historians, is that they go to the edges of their potential. And when somebody goes to the edges of the potential, they're taking the next natural step. And in some cases, it changes humanity. In other cases, maybe it changes a family legacy. But this is what the greats do, is they add to their body of work by extending their capabilities. Now, in those extended areas, in that place where they're not quite sure if they have what it takes, that's where luck, we want to diminish the amount of luck involved and make sure that we're increasing the amount of skill. And so is a lot of this about helping them overcome their nerves? Well, certainly the emotional component to exploring one's potential to, towards mastery, towards high performance and achievement and success, emotions are part of it. And, you know, emotions and thoughts and environment are the three legs to the stool. And while we might not be able to ever really manipulate our environment, we can manage our thoughts that influence our emotions. So those, those are the three components that we want to make sure we're investigating. That was amazing. Dr. Michael Trevace, thank you very much for joining us. Wonderful. Thank you. Feeling lucky, just feeling lucky, can change your chances of success. And as Dr. Michael Gervais was saying there, it's all about fighting your instincts, about overriding your gut, stepping outside of yourself and being objective. And I think there is something in there that uh, maths can empathise with. But OK, how about those people who are really lucky? So how about the ones, not just the ones who have maths and bravery on their side, but how about the people who walk away with the really big prizes, the ones uh, who stand out from the crowd, right? They're the real one in the millions. Well, I'll tell you what, let's try and find one. Because what we're going to do is we're going to whittle down all of you to find the luckiest person in our audience. And you know how we're going to do it? We've got a game show. So, are you feeling lucky? to welcome my glamorous assistant, Matthew Parker. Now, okay, everybody, if you would like to stand up, underneath your seats, you should have two hats. One is yellow, one is blue. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna run a series of semi-random rounds, and all you need to do is put on your blue hat or your yellow hat, 
whichever you think is most likely to win. If you're unlucky and you get one of the semi-random rounds incorrect, I'm afraid you don't have to sit down. You are out of the game. If you get it correct, you stay standing up. You're through to the next round. Okay, you ready to play? Let's go. Round one. Which of these two balloons is going to explode in a ball of fire? Is it yellow or blue? Make your votes now. Everyone's voted. It's quite loud. Cover your ears. Here we go. Ready? The blue one is not explosive, which means the yellow one is. Blue, you are wrong. Sit down. Yellow, stay standing up. Everybody, hats off. Round two. Round two is a race. If you think the blue channel cockroach will win, put on your blue hat. If you think yellow cockroach will win, yellow hat. Everyone ready? And they're off. <laughs> Come on. Round three. <laughs> okay, everyone. I've got a pancake here. One side of it is yellow, one side of it is blue. Once I flip the pancake, which side will land face up? Yellow or blue? Make your votes now. Here we go. Ready? Oh. <laughs> it's yellow! <laughs> blue, you lose. Sit down. Yellow, you are through to the next round. Everybody hands off. Round four. I found this person backstage. Is their name Dave? Is it Tom? If you think it's Dave, blue hat, Tom, yellow hat, look at him. That's the facial hair of a Dave, but the shirt of a Tom. What do you reckon? Okay, hat's on. And the correct name is? It's Tom! Blue, sit down. Yellow, stay up. Hats off. Round five. Who is tonight's extra special celebrity guest? Is it Operation Ouch's Dr. Zan Van Tulliken or Operation Ouch's Dr. Chris Van Tulliken, yellow or blue, make your bets now. And the answer is... Hey, hey! Hi, everybody. Which one are you? What? We've known each other for years. It's Zan Van Tulliken. Okay, uh, yellow, you are through to the next round. Thanks, Zan, that's all we need from you. Blue, sit down, everybody has some. Round six. Am I wearing blue socks? Am I wearing yellow socks? Vote now with your hats. Blue or yellow socks? Blue hats for blue, yellow for yellow. Yellow, blue, 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 yellow. Okay, are you ready? They are, have you, have you blue, ready? Yellow! <laughs> Blue's you down, yellow, stay up. Who have we got? One over there. We've got two over there. We've got one over there. Okay, everybody, hats off. Round seven. Which one of my two party blowers is going to be longer when I blow it? Is it going to be blue or yellow? Make your votes now. Okay, they made their bets. All right, here we go. And the answer was blue. Yellow, you lose. <laughs> Final round. Okay. 
We've got three people left. This one is a straight run between me and Matt as to who can get the balloon on their head to pop first. Uh, who wants to go? We're gonna, we need to, you need to pick a team this time. So uh, who wants to go for me? Thank you. And who's going for Matt? Oh, Thank goodness that music doesn't get annoying. <laughs> we have got, let's have a look. So we've got two blue and one yellow. Interesting, interesting. Okay. Okay, ready, Matt? Ready. Three, two, one, go. Breaker, will the blue yellow coin land blue or yellow? You've gone for yellow, you're going to go for blue. Are you ready? And the winner is. Yellow! We've got, we've got a crown for you, we've got a trophy for you. We're not going to give these to you just yet because uh, we really want you to prove that you are the luckiest person in the audience. So what you've got to do, Abby, is you have got to uh, just land a ping pong ball into that, okay? Um, now, we know you're lucky. I mean, you just beat everyone in this room. So uh, we're not going to make it too easy for you. Um, come and follow me, come and follow me. Um, we're going we're to shoot at the ping pong ball from up here. Is there... Let's see. Let's see how lucky you really are. We want you to get that crown. We want you to get that trophy. Um, <laughs> so if you just want to stand in there, your job now, I mean, is to, uh, is to try and fire it into there. Let's give us some encouragement as she goes. Come on. Come on, come on. Come on, you're the luckiest person. Not bad, not bad, not bad. Okay, we'll give it another go. We'll give it another go. Come on, come on. We really want you to get that crown. Come on. Oh, it's pretty close. Like they weren't lucky and someone just had to win. <laughs> I tell you, we can speed this up if we bring in the string. <laughs> Thank you for the string. <laughs> okay, of course, because the more times that you do something, even if it's really unlikely, eventually it becomes a mathematical certainty. Here we go. Abby, we're gonna put some safety glasses on you. Yeah? We're going to give you a scary looking glove. Okay, so this sets fire. Can you give us a test click? Make sure it's working. Okay, you're going to, in a second, we'll count down. You're going to set fire to the string. Are you ready? Count down from everyone. Three, Three two, two, one. one. Go. Whoa. Hang on, hang on, hang on. There's one in there! The luckiest person in the audience! <laughs> so, okay everyone, we have just discovered how we can use our understanding of math to get lucky. And in the next lecture, we're going to explore how we can up our chances of winning at even bigger challenges and learn that bending the rules can sometimes be good. Good night to the luckiest person. <laughs>